share a screen. If I see my head, if you see my head going forward, that's because I can't see and I'm looking at my screen. So don't fret. All right, hold on. I am looking for, I guess this, hold on. And I'm gonna be switching around a different share screen. So hopefully I don't crash and burn. I don't think I will, because I've been doing this for quite some time, but I'm just gonna get a little bit into the forecasting. I don't know what you wanna call it. Bible, basic, uh, you know, philosophy. I'm not gonna get real and deep in the science and all that, you know, a little bit, but this is more of a philosophy and, uh, you know, basic, how do you go about the forecasting process? Some of you, uh, I don't know if you're online or not, but I know some of you are in uh, internships that are doing forecasting right now. You know, so you're kind of getting a little experience in the field. Some of you are in broadcasting, I know, you know, so you're getting uh, some, some experience in that. So you're getting different, you know, areas where you get some, uh, practical everyday forecasting experience. Those who don't know me, teaching's half my job. I've been an operational forecaster all summer long. It's been very, very busy for me. Uh, you know, this kind of lets you know, uh, my background is in the space launch business and I do weather forecasting, weather support for space launches. I did it at Cape Canaveral for 80,000 years. Uh, uh, when I retired in 2013, I started teaching at FIT or Florida Tech, whatever it's called now. And uh, I do private consulting uh, for startup space launch companies uh, that need weather support. So I do day-to-day -day forecasting for three different space launch companies, two in California, one in New Mexico. Uh, I don't know if you've heard uh, today we had a space launch. I'm not, I don't, I don't yet have the contract to do the weather for Blue Origin. I'm working on it, but I do uh, my little one man company. Uh, I do forecasting for the Virgin Galactic uh, space launch. Uh, if you, that was about a week or so ago where the space plane dropped from a bigger plane and it went up to space and then it came back and landed on a runway. Richard Branson, if you follow Rich, famous guys, he's one of them. And uh, he went up last week and and Mr. Amazon went up. Am yeah, Mr. Amazon went up today, Bezos. So uh, uh, so that's what that's kind of where I get my day to day forecasting and things I'm going to talk about today. I use on a daily basis. So um, not just preaching from the book I'm preaching from my own experience. So anyway, this is some general forecasting. I'm not going to go through a whole lot here. Some words, some pictures, nothing too intense. I'm not going to read every one of these bullets, but you know, these are just one of the some of the main bullets uh from the synaptic book that I use uh for 3401 and 3402 some general approach to forecasting. You know, uh you know, it doesn't really say how to forecast. It's just you know, what processes and what uh, checklist items, whatever you want to call it, do you go through to, uh, you know, make these forecasts? So in terms of a general forecast, what general approach to forecasting? Physical processes, that's kind of the science, you know, the weather systems, you know, that's kind of a no brainer. What weather systems are going to be affecting your area? You know, a lot of different locations are uh, not just Florida, even though I live in Florida, I'm not really forecasting for Florida right now. I'm forecasting for not only California and New Mexico, but I'm also forecasting for Guam right now and uh, the UK because uh, one of my other clients uh, called Virgin Orbit, they launch satellites and they're going to be launching from California, Guam, United Kingdom. So many, many different locations. So this approach that I'm kind of going through is not Florida specific, it's not anywhere specific, but it gives you a good basis uh, to kind of narrow it down to wherever location you're at, if that's kind of making sense. But anyway, you look at the physical processes and in, in the systems that are gonna be 
mean, you know, affecting your area during a forecast period. You know, if you're in charge of the forecast over the next eight hours, you know, what's going to happen over the next eight hours, over the next two days, three days, that sort of thing. You know, then the next bullet, what are the next, you know, what are the key weather systems from the past? You know, what has your weather been the last couple of days and where is that weather now? How fast is it moving? Is it stronger or weaker than it was when it moved through you? You know, again, I don't read these bullets word for word. I'm kind of ad living here. Uh, but evolution of weather systems, you know, that's kind of one of the main topics that we get into in synoptic uh, the first semester is how do systems evolve? How do they move? How do they change uh, intensity? That sort of thing. Uh, so again, you look at the current and recent past weather to kind of get an idea of what's going to happen in the future. You want to see how things are moving, how fast they're moving. Uh, just kind of looking at the third bullet, you know, you know, the, the processes that you expect to, you know, get into your area. What are they looking at now? How are they operating now? You know, are they stronger, weaker? Why or why not? That sort of thing. And then that last thing, you know, in what way are these expected processes going to affect your area? So all these bullets kind of say the same thing, but it's more of a philosophy. It's not, you know, where's your low pressure? Where's your, you know, this, you know, it's more of a philosophy. And I like to talk a lot about philosophy when I talk about weather forecasting, because it's an art. You use science, but it's also an art as well. So when you get into the forecasting, you know, a lot of this is a review. But when we talk about forecasting, it's all going to be reviews because, you know, the basics of forecasting never changes. So I don't care how many years down the road and what you do down the road, you know, weather forecasting on the basic large scale to the small scale is going to be the same. So this forecasting process, the first thing you do is kind of look at your different scales. You know, we've talked, you know, you've seen this in classes in the past you know, or, and you will in the future. You know, the large scale, the planetary scale, then we call that the macro scale. That's your long wave troughs and ridges, the, you know, the planetary semi-permanent long wave pattern that encompasses the Earth. You know, and typically we have four or five long wave troughs and four or five main long wave ridges that encompass the globe. And they, you know, move very, very slowly. So that's kind of the first scale. You look and see where your big troughs and ridges are. And then you get into the synoptic scale, which is kind of the middle ground scale. And this is the scale that I you know, get into in depth in uh, MET 3401, 3402, the synoptic scale, hence synoptic meteorology. But it's kind of the scale about the size of the US, give or take. Size of North America at the biggest in terms of the scale that you're looking at. You're not looking globally, but you're looking, you know, at a at a continent or a country, you know, the size of the US. So we look at that scale. And when we get into this scale, one of the main processes that you look for is your troughs and ridges on the short wave scale or short wave troughs and ridges that move faster and move through the long wave pattern. I don't want to get too much in the weeds here. I'll be talking all night. But the short waves, they move faster and they're embedded in a long wave pattern. Now, when we talk about these short waves, very specific processes go on that tell you what this short wave trough or short wave ridge is going to do in terms of how it's going to move, how it's going to intensify and what kind of weather ultimately will it produce. Now, the big thing that we get into in the first uh, you know, 3401 is what we call quasi-geostrophic theory. And it's using the primitive equations of meteorology, which if you haven't seen them yet, you will. Uh, those equations are used and manipulated to come up with a technique and a theory and how to analyze synoptic scale features, synoptic scale troughs, synoptic scale ridges. How do they move and how do they change intensity? 
and we get into the specific physical processes that determine that. Now, in short, the two main things that you always want to look for when you're forecasting on a synoptic scale is advection patterns. And the two main parameters that you look at when we talk about advection patterns is vorticity and temperature. Because when we get into this quasi-geostrophic theory, it's vorticity advection and temperature advection that are the main drivers, the main forcing mechanisms that determine synoptic scale evolution of troughs and ridges, both in terms of how they move and how they intensify. So you get, you know, when you're into the forecasting process, you really, really want to be good at identifying advection patterns, both in the vorticity field and in the temperature field. Because again, it's those two physical processes that determine a lot in forecasting, okay? So that's kind of the middle ground scale. And that's kind of where my, you know, I'm, I'm lack of expertise is lack of better words, but that's where most of my experience is. And then once you get beyond the mesoscale, then you get into where the most important part is, where you are, you know, what city you're in, what state you're in, what country, you know, what small area that you're in. When you get into the mesoscale and the micro scale, that's where the, you know, the, the key is to your eventual forecast. Because when you forecast, you're forecasting for a very, at least majority of the time, a very specific location, all right? So those are the kind of the scales that you, you go through. But I always like to harp on and emphasize the fact that you always start, you know, a couple of slides that emphasize this, you always start big and then you work your way to the small scale. So kind of very simple, don't want to insult, it's late in the evening, so maybe simple pictures are better right now, but the different scales that we looked at, you know, again, the global scale, and then the synoptic scale, or you look at, I hate that they have the, the surface features here, because when I talk synoptic scale, I always talk about the upper levels. Surface, yeah, I do talk about it, but it's an after, you know, it's a second semester I get into what's going on at the surface, but to me, if you want to be a good forecaster, you have to be a good forecaster on the synoptic scale. And you have to be a good forecaster in the upper levels. Because whatever goes on at the ground is being driven by what goes on in the upper levels. So I would have put a more of an upper level trough, but they have it in these regions. So you have the long wave troughs, and then you got the short wave troughs in the, meso in the uh, synoptic scale, excuse me. And then your mesoscale, those are your small scale. Your, if you're in Florida, you got your sea breezes, you got your thunderstorm outflow boundaries. If you're in the elevated terrain regions, you got lifting from mountains and uh, metropolitan areas, you get their own little small scale features that, you know, that affect the weather. And then you got even smaller scale. But when you're forecasting for a specific spot, you know, you're normally going to be spending most of your time on the mesoscale. You got to know what's going on in the large scale, but you're always going to have to adjust and look at the local regions, you know, all the different idiosyncrasies. Every location has their own little, you know, twits about forecasting. You know, Florida, it's the sea breezes. You know, when I'm dealing with uh, the deserts of New Mexico and um, Mojave, it's desert and mountains, you know, so they have their own little different mesoscale features. So, but everything is driven by the synoptic scale and above that, and then it works its way down. So I always kind of start, up, you know, in a big scale and work again to the small scale. So you look at the hemispheric pattern one thing I didn't talk about that's also very important in terms of synoptic scale and global scale is your jet stream, obviously. You want to know where your jet stream maxima are located. Again, I'm not going to get into specifics uh, looking at jet maxes and how you forecast, but 
they are very, very important in looking at long, you know, long, large scale weather uh, forecasting and whatnot. So again, when you look at the large scale, you're going back three to five days in time and look and see what happened. How are you going to forecast what's going on in the future if you didn't know what happened in the last couple of days? You know, it kind of makes sense to me. And then, you know, you think to yourself, you talk to yourself, you know, where's your jet maxes, things like that. You know, then you locate your troughs and ridges, both long wave and then working down into the short wave and then getting into, you know, synoptic and mesoscale patterns. So start with the big hemispheric pattern. And then you get into synoptic scale pattern where you talk, you know, about the upper air analyses and, you know, the, I'm a big analysis guy. I don't, you know, in my synoptic class, I don't show a lot of models per se. I show a lot of analyses, especially in terms of satellite and radar and upper air analyses. Because in my book, if you can't analyze, you're not going to be able to forecast if that's what you want to do in, you know, in the uh, meteorology industry. So again, that's a synoptic scale. At the end of this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is called model initialization and, and verification using satellite data. Just kind of a little technique that I really didn't talk about in synoptic, uh, synoptic course per, month, per se. Uh, but again, it's a good, and I don't have a lot of examples and didn't wanna spend a lot of time on it, but I didn't wanna go over what this, using satellite, to initialize and verify models and analyses. And that's a good forecast process. I do it all the time. So when you are a forecaster, again, you know, you ask yourself, you know, what synoptic systems are going to be affecting my area. And then when you know that, then you know how to specifically look at these systems and know what things to look for. Again, looking at those advection patterns and and things like that that determine specific weather. So again, identify and forecast evolution of short waist troughs and ridges. Again, we get into this a whole lot in, uh, in the synoptic course when we start talking about the quasi geostrophic theory. Okay, so that's a synoptic scale. Again, that's kind of the United States size, maybe a little bit bigger. And then you get into the smaller scale, which is more important for your local forecast, obviously. So you want to spend more time on the smaller scale things. You know, what is going on in your local area? And again, you have to be in a certain area for a while to get the, what I call the local idiosyncrasies or physiographic effects or whatever is going on locally that affects the weather, whether it's orographic, whether it's land, water, interfaces, is it big urban effects, you know, whatever is causing your local weather to change. And then mesoscale convection, you know, especially in the summertime, like where we are right now, it's, you know, your synoptic scale is not all that exciting right now. It's in the summertime mode, at least in the Northern hemisphere, obviously. And all these synoptic scale things I've just been talking about is not great, you know, this time of year. Most of the synoptic scale forcing right now is up in Southern Canada, Northern US, clipping the Northern tier of the Great Lakes and, and clipping the Northeastern tier of the US. That's where the main, you know, jet stream, and even though it's weaker right now, that's where the main track is, storm track is. But in the summertime, Mesoscale convection plays a big role. You still look at the large scale, you know, fronts, you know, although fronts are weak, they don't move, they kind of sit in the same spot for weeks on end, but it's there. But it's the mesoscale convection, your moisture availability, how stable or unstable you are. You know, usually, you know, going back to your skew T diagram analyses, how to determine stability or lack thereof you know how is convection going to be big player in your region or not so you use a lot of thermodynamic forecasting in the summertime you know when you get in down to the mesoscale uh, location you know you pull out your local skew t or wherever you are the closest skew t and and you go through that process 
you do you go through that process all year round, but I'm just saying I tend to use skew teas more in the summertime convection season than I do in these winter time, you know, more synoptic scale forcing season. But anyway, it's still very, very important. And again, this is the small scale process. Very simple pictures um, in what we call the forecast funnel where in what is called the time pyramid. And what this is supposed to represent, if you've seen this before, I apologize. Uh, so it's not very in detailed, obviously, but it's very, you know, it says a lot with very little. Basically the forecast funnel means that you always start at the top, you know, you always look at the big scale first, and then you work your way down to the small scale. In other words, you look at your large scale long wave pattern, and then you look at your synoptic scale patterns, and then you work your way down to the smaller scale wherever you are pattern. So that's what it means by the funnel. Start big and then work your way to the local scale. The time pyramid basically is inverted with, the for, with this funnel, meaning that this tells you how much time you should spend in each one of these uh, areas. So the, you know, the large scale area, you spend your little amount of time. You know, I spend almost two semesters talking about synoptic. When you get into the field and day-to-day -day forecasting, you wanna be able to analyze your large scale very quickly. Because if there's anybody online who's in the field right now, especially in broadcasting and whatnot, we all have deadlines. You know, and a lot of times you don't have three hours to prepare a forecast. Sometimes you got 10 minutes. So sometimes this large, you know, sometimes you're doing this process very quickly. But irregardless, when we compare, you spend most of your time on your local scale and your local scale excuse me, your mesoscale, the idiosyncrasies, the small things that are going to influence your local temperatures, your local winds, your local humidities, your rain chances, that sort of thing. So again, that's what just this forecast funnel and time pyramid is supposed to represent. Again, you should be, you know, if you get into the forecast industry and when you get experience, this, these top two levels, you're doing very quickly. And again, you're spending most of your time on the, uh, the small scale. Now, this is just, again, I'm an analysis guy. So I think your analysis determines everything. So when you're forecasting and you know, whatever, the, um, how your models are, how accurate or not, you know, everything is based on a good analysis. So to be a good forecaster, you have to be a good analysis person. And you have to have a great understanding of the physical, you know, processes that go on when you make a forecast. And different time, you know, different strategies, you know, different ways in which you put out a forecast, what we call persistence forecasts, a climatological forecast, analog and, and a consensus kind of ensemble forecast. I'm not going to go in. These are just very simple bullets, the different kind of methods that you go through when you put out a forecast. Persistence is the easiest one. That just says whatever it was like today is going to be that way tomorrow if you're not expecting any changes kind of thing. You know, if the weather's not going to change, whatever the forecast is today, the same tomorrow. You know, trends, you know, look upstream of you. Look what's coming at you to be able to forecast the future. You always want to know upstream weather. Uh, then analog is when you know when you're when you've done forecasting for a while, and you remember a certain weather event, and you remember the kind of conditions that produce that weather event. Where if you see that weather event or weather you know puzzle coming together again kind of remember what happened before. And so you forecast the same thing. If you have the same kind of processes, forecast similar kind of conditions. That's kind of what analog means. Climatology is just that. 
you know, future predictions monthly. Not only do you get averages, you get extremes for, you know, certain times of the year at certain locations and that sort of thing. So everyone kind of knows what climatology is. And then the big one is numerical weather prediction. That, those are all your models. All your supercomputer crunching and of your uh, primitive equations and all that. And then there's what you call reading the sky or rules of thumb. These are your own personal things that you use that if you notice that work, you know, in your own forecasting analysis, you know, that, that you pick up uh, over the years. So this is just kind of a personal, you know, rule of thumb kind of thing. So these are just the different methods, whether you realize it or not you going through one of these methods when you put out a forecast, you know, this is, I'm not going to, this is very simple stuff. Persistence, don't change the forecast if the weather is not going to change. This is best for short term. You don't want to do a persistence forecast for a week. In other words, you only want to do one, maybe two days, maybe three days if it's in the summertime and there's nothing's happening that you can use persistence. All right. Analog is what we can pattern recognition. You remember the pattern that produced a weather event in the past. You notice that same pattern kind of happening again. So you forecast a very similar weather event. Again, you do this without realizing it, especially when you've been forecasting for a while. Climatology is just that. Not only it gives you averages, it gives you extremes for certain times of the year and certain locations for temperature, wind, and all sorts of things. So climate is kind of self-explanatory. And then, you know, NWP, that is the, you know, backbone. Sophisticated numerical weather prediction models, not only large scale models, but uh, small scale and then mesoscale models as well. So all these different scales that I've been talking about we have numerical weather models that some are good for large scale, some are good for small scale things. But anyway, NWP, which I think it's a class in your senior year, if I'm not mistaken. If some of these, some of you I know have already had this and already done with school. But anyway. They're not doing it this year. I was going to take it, but Dr. Ray's not doing it. Why? I don't know. He said he has too much to do, so he only downgraded to dynamics only. Huh, okay. That's too bad. All right. He has too much to do. Very good. All right. Good info. Anyway, you know, this is obvious things, no brainer things, forecast parameters, specific things that you forecast for. You know, if you're, whether you're in broadcasting or doing what I do, forecasting for, you know, space launches, you know, they all want to know all the same things, just in different formats and different time frames and different uh, resolution, that sort of thing. But temperatures, dew points, humidity, precipitation, not only in terms of how much, but the uh, chance of probability. I have just one slide kind of referencing a, a paper showing you the importance of probability forecasting. That's a whole three seminars in itself or more talking about probability forecasting, but it's very important. I use it in my line of work. You know, obviously they, they do it on, you know, broadcasting and, but everybody uses probability forecasting. And it's a, it's a good way to forecast because in short, it gives your customer a risk factor. You know, if you give them a 30% chance of lightning, you're telling the customer, well, you got a 30% risk that you're going to get hit by lightning type of thing. So that's kind of where that comes in. And then wind, you know, typical direction speed and then cloud coverage. So these are just obvious and these and a lot more, but these are obviously the more, you know, popular things that you forecast for. All the different, I don't know why this thing, I don't even know if it's showing up on all the other ones, these little rectangular geostationary lightning mapper. I don't know why that's there, but it's showing up on mine. Anyway, I'm talking to myself, but forecast guidance, all the different offices. I know you got this in your library. Uh, well, I was gonna, what I'm gonna emphasize kind of towards the end is 
in the weather prediction center site, they have all the weather discussions, you know, all the forecast discussions talking about, you know, their thoughts on the forecast and comparing the models and this and that. If you're not in the habit of reading those discussions and you get into the forecasting industry, it's a good habit to get into is read what the forecasters are thinking of, not only nationally, but also locally at the local offices, read the forecast discussions. But again, these are all the main agencies uh, US wide. And this is a good uh, site, uh, all your model guidance. You know, there's many others, both government and commercial sites out there that have all the guidance for you. Uh, hold on, let me get to the, I'm just realizing I got some uh, chat things here, hold on. Real free look to trigger and then forecast discussions are incredibly helpful. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, for, uh, I'll look at these pictures too in a second. But uh, the, the forecast discussions, again, not only nationally, but locally. So you got a good idea what, you know, their thinking is in, in that matter. I'm just, uh, nah, hold on a second. All right. Make sure I got all that. So, yeah. So that's where the numerical guidance is. And I'm going to be showing you other satellite screens here in a second. So. I just wanted to get through a lot of this. I already showed you this one. Okay. A lot of words. I'm not going to go through it all. You'll have this. But this is just a good checklist on things to look for at all the different levels. I, I should have had 300 on top and go down to the surface, but I got it backwards but all the different mandatory levels and the things that you should look for forecast wise. You know, when you look at the upper levels, jet streams, jet streaks, upper level divergence, you know, things that, you know, things that intensify low pressures, you know, kind of remember how we talked about in synoptic, if you've had my synoptic course, and then getting down to the 500 millibars, you're looking at, uh, you know, vorticity uh, patterns and areas of advection, both vorticity and temperature. You know, and you can look at this as a general steering flow as well for mid-latitude cyclonic storms. So the middle, you know, 500 millibar winds are, and the upper level winds are good for the steering level. 700 is a good for moisture. If you want to know where your deep moisture and good moisture is, a good uh, area is, is kind of to look at is the middle of the atmosphere. And I'm going to talk about model initialization using satellite for, you know, in a little bit. But look at the satellite picture and see if it corresponds to where the 700 millibar shows moisture. And I'll tell you if the 700 millibar is a good, you know, accurate chart or not. But again, temperature advection is very important at 700 millibars for uh, strengthening and weakening of upper level systems, fronts, and, and not only upper level systems, but surface systems as well. But again, I don't want to get too much in the weeds with this. These are just main items. Lower in the atmosphere, 850 millibars, you're looking for, you know, again, moisture, high moisture levels, you're looking for low level convergence. You know, again, another big thing about the synoptic course is we analyze large scale upper or rising air, I should say, upward vertical motion. So we always emphasize where the upper level divergence and lower level convergence are, because those two provide upper level or provide rising air. So at the lower levels, you always want to look at the, uh, the convergence, low level jet streams for thunderstorm development, things of that nature. And then the surface, you know, all the different things that you look for. This is the, you know, the more important one, because this is what you're going to be forecasting for, you know, in your local scale. But I always start aloft. 
You got to know what's going on above before you're going to know what's going on at the ground. But again, just spend less time with the upper level stuff and more time with the surface stuff. You should be able to get into a good, you know, don't have to look at the upper level features real for a length of time to know what's going on. You get into a groove, you get into a habit. Uh, ensemble forecasting, just a little bit about ensemble forecasting. You know, each one of the models has what is called a deterministic forecast, which is your primary forecast, which is the one they publicize. But then they use the same model and they change the initial condition slightly and run the model many different times. They just kind of change the initial, you know, condition a little bit and they run the model again. So they do this many, many different times and they'll get different results. So they look at all the different results and this is kind of giving you an ensemble of what could possibly happen given all the different varieties in the model. The deterministic one is again, the primary one. That's with the real initial data. But after you tweak the initial data a little bit, you know, your winds, your temperature, whatever, you'll get a different solution. So you'll get a, you'll get your deterministic forecast and then you'll get your ensemble, all your different options from, by tweaking the initial data, you'll get, you know, different forecasts. This encompasses your forecast uncertainty. In other words, these are all the different possibilities. So that's why they, they call it an ensemble. It's kind of looking at all of this on. So when you, if you wanted to look at the average of all these, you know, you would take where most of these are kind of going. And then climatology is just kind of the outer, showing you even a longer uh, spread. But again, this is the short time and going, you know, time is increasing to the right. That's just what a ensemble forecast is. If you ever hear about that, it takes the same model, runs at many, many different times by just changing the initial data and gives you all the different possibilities. An example of an ensemble forecast for a hurricane, you know, all the different options on the right here. And then that's kind of how they get the, uh, the air cone. You know, the typical errors that you get out, you know, get from forecasting, the further out you go. Just like the ensemble, the further out you go, the bigger the spread is. So that's what we call ensemble forecasting. You know, I kind of go through this quickly. Time ranges, that's another thing you worry about when you talk about forecasting, whether it's short, medium, or long range. You know, short range is a couple days to three days, medium range, three to five, long range, more to five, more than five and more than seven, it varies. But this is just the basic time. Now, when you look at one day forecast and hour by hour forecast, this is just an example. You know, you can do hour by hour forecast. And I use this product a lot. This is just an example forecast. Uh, but I use this product a lot in my uh, space launch forecasting when I want to do the hour by hour for one day forecast because they're they care about each hour. They're not they don't care about in general. They want very specific by the by the hour. So that's just kind of a one day very high resolution forecast for different uh, different parameters. If, you know, you get this on the National Weather Service site. If you're not familiar, I can show you offline uh, where to find these if you don't know. And then if, you know, if you want to look at the different time ranges, I think it's a little bit out of order, but this is from the uh, weather prediction site and the, just a different length of time that you can get your forecast from you know, the ultraviolet radiation and watches, this is supposed to mean real time. Both our watches and warnings and your space weather, those are real time forecasts. So those are your short term, very sh your shortest term. Then you got your, you know, two days, 
48 hour forecast and you got your three to seven days, a little bit longer, you know, then this is kind of the medium, then you get into your long term, six to 10 days, eight to 14, monthly, seasonal. So this is just your suite of the official forecasts that are put out by the Weather Prediction Center. Yeah, this is a real high detail of forecast. This is just to illustrate one thing. The further out you go, this you, you kind of look at the probability here. One good rule of thumb, when you are putting out a week long forecast, your highest probabilities, whether it's, you know, for good weather or high weather, whatever it is, you should be very close to 100 or zero on your one and two day forecasts. You know, as you get, so in this example, you're very close to 100. But your short term, you should be very close to almost binary, yes or no. And then when you get out to, you know, two, three, four days, your accuracy decreases somewhat. By the time you get out to seven days, you know, you only have about 50% accuracy. So when you get out to the end of your seven day forecast, you should almost be going with climatology. That's a good rule of thumb. I use a lot that when you get out to the end of your seven day forecast, just go by what the local climatology for that time of year is, if that makes sense. Because it's, you know, when you're forecasting seven, eight, nine days out, you know, your accuracy is only gonna be about 50%. So it's always good to go with whatever the local climatology is for that location for that time of year. Again, that's when you get to the end of your long range forecast. At the beginning, you should be again, either yes or no. And then in between, as you get to a further out. So again, this is how time affects your forecast. That's, I just wanted to illustrate the accuracy and illustrate the point again, you should be going with climatology at the end of your forecast period. Even further out than that, you go to the, you know, the Climate Prediction Center site where you can get two weeks out, where they give you basically just above and below average compared to normal for, the, again, time of the year, location. These are, this is not current. Uh, this is many years ago, actually, in the wintertime. But uh, it'll give you, when you get to two weeks and beyond, It'll give you the dotted lines or dashed lines are your normals. And then the color scheme is whether or not you're gonna be above that normal or below that normal, both in temperature and in precip. So you look at the dotted line, wherever you are forecasting for, see what your normal is. And then you can see if you're gonna be above or below that normal for the next two weeks, you know, or for the eight to 14 day, uh, Time frame. It'll give you a valid time. So this is just valid for eight to fourteen days, and then you can do the same thing for a month. Again, what is normal, and do you expect to be above, below, or equal chance? That's what EC means. Equal equal chance means you will be pretty much normal for that time of year. And then you can even go seasonal, three months out. So if you're not familiar with looking at these, you know, these are on the climate prediction site. And there are so many other sites out there, you know, on different products that you can look at. These are the basic ones. But if you ever have, a, you know, time on your hands, I know you don't much, but, uh, you know, look at, the different, look at the different products that are offered out there. There's so many of them. Probability forecasting, again, I just, you know, if you're interested, this is a very, from the AMS, uh, very good paper on how probability forecasting has enhanced weather forecasting in general. Why do we use probability forecasting? You know, probability, you know, if it's on TV, and I can probably attest to this, you're given a probability of the aerial coverage of the area you're forecasting for. 
you know, 30% of my area is going to have rain type of thing. Now, when I do probability forecasting for my space launches, I'm giving them a probability of one of the very specific weather rules being violated. It's still a probability, but it's not, you know, you're kind of giving little apples and oranges there. So you just got to be know what you're given the probability for. But in general, you know, they give the, it's an aerial coverage of the area that you're responsible for. Again, this is a good paper on if you're ever interested in knowing uh, why probability forecasting is used. <clears throat> All right. Last thing I kind of wanted to go over is something called satellite initialization and verification. And uh, when I'm done with these couple slides, and I'll, then I'll show you some, a couple of satellite pictures, just kind of show you what I'm talking about. I don't want to get into depth about this too much, but it's just a technique on how to use satellite imagery to initialize your model forecast or your forecast. You know, when we talk about initialization, it's basically just a process the forecaster goes through to access the accuracy of the initial analysis. In other words, your zero, zero hour forecast, how accurate is that? Because that is your initial analysis that is used to do your long range forecast, your numerical forecast, your 168 hours and everything. But in other words, you want to determine how good is this initial analysis? Because the accuracy of this analysis, I can't talk, will affect the accuracy of the model's forecast. That makes sense. So we use satellite data to assess uh, the accuracy of these forecasts. When we talk about initialization in forecasting, the goal of it is again is to compare the model's initial analysis to what we call independent data. An example of independent data is satellite data. So I just kind of wanted to emphasize satellite on this little portion here. But you're just looking at your, you know, your zero, zero hour forecast or your initial forecast. And then you look at your satellite data to see if it jives. You know, there could be analysis errors. You know, the satellite data is true data. You know, when you look at satellite and you look at clouds, that's what's going on. You know, you got to make sure that your analysis kind of fits what's really going on. And that's how you determine, you know, whether your initial analysis is accurate or not. So when you go through this, you're kind of looking at two different uh, areas of data. You know, when they go through what is called an objective analysis scheme, you know, when they start the model, you know, every six hours and they run the model, you know, they start with an objective analysis scheme. I don't want to get into the depth of all that. But what they do is they use rayout data, upper air data, balloon data, both the mandatory and significant levels. This is what we, this is the one of the data sources that are used. And then typically what they do for a starting point for an initial analysis, they use the previous 12 hour forecast from the, pre the previous runs 12 hour forecast or the previous runs six hour forecast. I think I did this back when models were only 12 hours. Now they do maybe six hours. So you can do the previous six hour model forecast to use that as the next one's initial analysis, if that makes sense. So you go to the previous forecast and go to the zero six hour or 12 hour point. And you use that as your initial for the next model run. And then you take that initial analysis and you compare it with what we call independent data. And it's data that is not used by the, what we call objective analysis scheme. Independent data of the model. Best examples are satellite and radar especially satellite on a larger scale. So you look at your RAAP data and you look at your you know, initial analysis and then you compare that to your satellite. And if they compare well, both in terms of, you know, winds and moisture and you know, observations and, and everything, 
then you know it was a good analysis and your forecast from then can be taken with uh, some confidence. All right, looking at my chats here. Okay, good night. See you, Anna. I'm almost done anyway. All right, so again, you're just comparing satellite data with your initial analysis. So just kind of a step process that you go through and you can look at this later on. I know it's getting late, but you just, you know, you overview your data. The first thing that you do is you look and see what kind of data that you have, both in terms of ray obs and in terms of uh, independent or satellite data. And then you analyze the data and compare. Compare your satellite with your analysis of where your troughs and ridges, high, you know, RH, those sort of things. So you're just comparing your data with your uh, satellite. So that's just kind of the technique very quickly you can do to see if your, you know, model is getting off to a good start. And then for verification, you can just look at the, you know, the past few model runs and see how they verified. You know, we do that all the time verifying your forecast. So you get an idea how the model's doing. So again, what I was saying before is always read the forecast discussions, both at WPC and your local offices for getting a good handle on forecast initialization, forecast thoughts, what they think of the model trends, what models are the best, that sort of thing. So this is the best place to go. You just click that on to get all those discussions. So when in doubt, I always use my forecasting stone. All right, so there you go. That's really all I had. And I didn't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, I guess I'll leave that I'll, You know, I wanted to, I think I wanted to show a little bit of, real quick, I'm sorry. So again, I just wanted to show a satellite real quick. So if this was the current satellite, you would just go, you know, to your upper air observations and and make sure your observations are showing a lot of moisture where the clouds are. You know, if you can see on your satellite, you know, if you get to be a good satellite interpretation for systems, you can see where ridges are, you can see where troughs are, that sort of thing. So you can initialize and look and see where your troughs and ridges are on the satellite. And then you can compare that to your analysis. So again, I didn't, you know, I want to get into the satellite comparing it more, but uh, I just wanted to show you, I know we're getting a little bit late here, the, the quick process, okay? And then you can just go to any, uh, you know, any analysis whether that's on government sites or wherever you get your analyses in that and compare them to the satellite. All right, so again, that's all I had. Uh, I'll open it up to anybody who has any comments or questions or anything you wanna discuss. But that is all I had. Um, I have sort of a really big question that I don't know if you'll be able to give a short answer to. But I was wondering why for the um, forecasting contest, they always tell us that the models are bad to use for uh, max wind speed. Do you, is there like a simple reason for that or? A simple reason why the models are bad for max wind speed. I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. Uh, That, I, you know, it depends on the location and just looking at your different locations and, and whatnot. It's all I can think of. But you also on that one WPC side, it also gives you model biases. You know, the models have biases, the natural biases. And uh, one of them may be higher wind speeds. One of the models may show higher wind speeds and whatnot. But I know that's not answering your question. Uh, that's the best one I have right now. But I'll, I'll try to... I'll look into that and then I'll get back to you on that. But uh, right off hand, I don't have a real good answer why they always show max, you know, higher winds on the models. I can right. try it. Go, if any, go for okay, it. Yeah. yeah, go I, for it, man. I guess so, that you would have input. <laughs> yeah, I so, always count on, I always count on Colin to save me. So go for it, man. So, so I guess sort of think about what the, the goal of the forecast challenge is. It's a little bit different than regular forecasting. 
Partially because, well, one, your, your tolerance is zero, basically, due to the nature of because it's a competition. Uh, one thing is that we're forecasting more or less an instantaneous wind speed max. Like, it's not a gust, but it's, we just need for it to peak at whenever observation, right? And that, in most forecasting, you don't need to be like the difference, like one not accurate is generally not what you're trying to do. You're trying to provide useful information to a to whoever the partner or client is. And I think with the it does depend on the exact location. One of the things is that greatly affects states because we're we're not forecasting like for a city. We're literally forecasting for a specific ASOS site. So the model at guess. best is a mesoscale model at best. So we're talking somewhere between you know maybe between three and twelve kilometer model, and you're forecasting basically on the scale of meters. So there's no way the model is going to pick up like a tunneling effect between two hangars at the airport. The model is never going to be able to do that, at least an operational forecast model. That's a very good point, not to interrupt, but just to say, yeah, no, the, the scale size of the models. If you want a very, to pick up these high wind speeds, you need a very localized mesoscale model. So they're, very, they're specialized, you know, again, uh, they do exist. But again, I agree with Colin, you would need to, definitely higher res models for the local area, you know, than the broader, you know, GFS and whatnot. So it's, yeah, no, that's, that's definitely, and then it, of course there's, there's, there's like little things like, you know, is the ASOS on a hill? Is it going over concrete before it gets from what's under wind directions? Is it going over a smoother surface, water, terrain? Uh, so I would say that's, that's at least a part of it. Um, of course, there's areas where the models do better than others. And obviously situations, if it's, uh, but uh, I think if there's a little bit better way, it's a, it's a hard question to answer because it, the answer truly is it depends. That's really the, that's really the answer. Um, I agree, yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a hard question. Now, I guess specifically for, Wex challenge, why we say that. Um, I'm trying, normally, I guess the most you know, often we say, we tell you guys to look at MOS, at least starting out. And that's a basically a statistical correction of the biases. And it's run for GFS and the NAM. Though, I, though you could theoretically do it for whatever model you wanted. Uh, it's just a linear regression. Uh, for reasons that I'm not going to really go into the weeds on. But that does really well for sort of, well, first of all, it does really well in synoptic conditions. Uh, it's, there's, it does, that model does really well for synoptic forecasting. And it, it gets, I'm kind of looping myself back to our whole scale thing. But I would think that's the best answer for specifically in the context of forecast challenge, why we say what we say. Because even the moss is a synoptic product. Yep, makes sense. Most of my space launch forecasting over the last, you know, couple of three weeks is definitely single station, you know, forecasting. You know, it's it's I used I definitely use a synoptic scale. Uh, to get abroad, I always look at the upper levels to know what's going to happen at the ground. But once I get to the ground, it definitely depends on, uh, you know, not to be obvious, it depends on where you're at. You know, what more? You, you're surrounded by mountains, you're surrounded by trees, you're surrounded by buildings, you're surrounded by nothing. You know, it makes a difference. So. They didn't give you an easy place to forecast, did they? No. <clears throat> So anyway, again, Grand that's, Kansas. yeah, yeah. So anyway, again, I, I didn't get too detailed with forecasting. I just wanted to get into basic, uh, 
you know, processes and philosophy and things it, like more that. More basics is always nice because it feels like every forecaster kind of has their own take on on the basics. That is true. Yes. So Thank I know we. Well, we have. Uh, if if any of you guys need to go, that's absolutely fine. I was going to say I do know there's some people who are a little unfamiliar with terminology. Uh, particularly uh, what we mean by short and long wave troughs and whatnot, or at least how to graph or visually see on a map. Perhaps we could go over that real quick. I don't have any slides per se for that, but again, just a long, when I talk about a long wave trough and ridge, I'm talking about, uh, uh, again, if you look at the entire globe, there's only like four or five main long wave troughs and ridges that encompass the, uh, encompass the globe. And they don't, you know, they slowly go around. Uh, just by the name, they're long. You know, they, they cover very large areas. And then within this, there are what we call short waves that are like little ripples in the long way in, uh, you know, in the, in the wave pattern. And it's the short waves that really give us all of our weather per se. That's where all your advection, vorticity and temperature advection takes place in short waves. You know, we'll talk about something barotropic versus baroclinic. What we're gonna say is long waves are barotropic, meaning that there is no temperature advection and, uh, See that, and then uh, short waves uh, do have advection. So long waves have no advection; they're barotropic, and short waves we call baroclinic, where that means there is advection going on and things like that. And we get into all the differences and, and whatnot. But again, you know, the best way to describe it is you know, long wave again is only four or five around the globe. And we talk about short waves, there's many, many within the long wave that, that, you know, travel through the long wave pattern. You know, short waves move much faster and they're much smaller. I don't have any charts per se, you know, handy to, to show you, but- you can, you can use what I put in the chat if you'd like. I'm sorry? You can use what I put in the chat if you'd like. They're not perfect, but, and they're current. You've got 300 just, 500 there. How am I opening? I don't know how to. You should be able just to click on them. Yeah, if not, I can me. share the screen. Yeah, once you I share can. it, I'll get off once you share the screen because um, it's not allowing me to do it. I tried to do it before, but it's not. So Yeah, I had to choose a file location. Yeah, I had first. to choose a file. So that's, I got, so I'll, I'll, let me stop the share and I'll let you take over. I'll give you 500 millibars. Since that's a good. You just restart. There you oh, there it goes. I was say start on his screen again. No, oh, yeah. here we go. So this, you know, looking at this pattern, you know, this is a three, this is 500 millibar. You know, this is kind of the separation between long waves and short waves. Uh, we typically look at short waves beginning at the 500 millibar pattern. Uh, they actually show up better at 700 millibars and whatnot sometimes, but the 500 millibar pattern is where we find, you know, our major shortwave troughs. If we were to like look at the whole globe and look at these big, you know, the big long waves or whatnot, that would be the more of the long wave pattern. But this whole big ridge here, you know, that could be a, a you know, the big long wave, but then you have minor short waves that are kind of rotating through it. I would not call this trough here a long wave trough. This is more, you know, kind of a, a short wave in here. It only, but again, it's hard in the summertime, you know, Northern hemisphere summer, the, these waves are not all that pronounced per se. But if you're looking just at a US scale, you're typically looking at uh, short waves. When you're looking at a more hemispheric, or global scale, you're looking more at a long wave pattern. If you were to look at 
like 700 millibars, you would see advection pattern more, temperature advection pattern more. Uh, the temperature advection pattern is strongest in the low levels and weakens as it gets to the 500 millibar level, especially in the summertime. You know, again, summertime is it's hard to see any attempt. There's not much temperature advection going on, you know, in the northern hemisphere summer, obviously, but you typically see your strongest temperature advection patterns in the lower levels of the atmosphere. Your vorticity advection patterns you see at the upper levels of the atmosphere, you know, the 500 millibars. So I don't know if that, that's all I had to say on that one. Anyone else out there? Yep, sorry, too many buttons here. No, oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that hopefully that gave everyone kind of a, a, a brief idea. Yeah. And again, the more you can see, the more if you if you're familiar with looking at temperature advection patterns, they show up much easier in the 700, 850 millibar levels. Temperature advection, especially in the summertime, but even you know, in the wintertime, your temperature advection pattern usually weakens as you get to the 500 millibar and aloft. Nor when we talk about 500 and aloft, we're looking at upper level mechanisms and we're looking at vorticity and jet max and jet streaks and things of that nature. When we look at the temperature advection patterns, we're focusing in on the you know, 700, 850, things like that. You know, when I get into this, if you're taking my synoptic class, we get into geo, quasi geostrophic, you know, we talk about all that, you know, in, in depth. <clears throat> You'll also do that a lot in dynamics too. Yeah, I'm sure. It's only up from here. Uh, hmm? Thank so y'all. I'm, I'm finished. Really so I'm, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to sign off. I got to get late for me. So, uh, you know, I can do another one and send out some more and do and get some more examples in that if you want. Uh, I didn't, I just didn't have a whole lot presented tonight, but I can do more in the future if you like. So just let me know. All right. Thank you. You guys, yeah, you guys take care. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.